Amen. Woo. Well, there's some power in the room this morning. Amen. Man, what an amazing day. An amazing day to come and to celebrate. Man, I'm excited to be here. Thank you guys for being here and happy Easter. Happy Easter to all of you. Happy Easter to those of you who are with us online. We are blessed that you all would choose to be with us. We know there's a lot of things you could be doing today. We know that some of you are already contemplating and thinking past this to uh, Easter brunch. But um, give me a couple minutes and I think it'll be worth your time. Thank you all uh, for being here. You know, there was a story about a guy who was out working in the yard. And uh, as he was working in the yard, his dog came up. And as, uh, as those of you who are dog owners know, they like to chew up stuff, right? And this dog came over, and he was chewing on something. That at, at closer look, he, he noticed that uh, the dog had something in his mouth, and the dog got closer, and he realized it, it was a rabbit. And the guy thought, well, that's okay. He's a retriever. He's supposed to do that stuff. But then as the dog got closer, he realized that the rabbit that was in the dog's mouth was fluffy, the next door neighbor's rabbit. Yeah. And, uh, and so he got frightened. He didn't know what to do. He thought, oh my gosh, you know, our, our dog has killed the neighbor's rabbit. So he grabs the rabbit, takes it over to the hose. He starts hosing this thing off. He's cleaning the dirt and the dog slobber and the blood. He's just like hosing this thing down. And he's like, what am I going to do? And so he grabs a hair dryer. Starts hair drying this thing, gets it all fluffed up, and then he sneaks into the neighbor's backyard and he puts it back in the rabbit cage, right? And then he goes home and he thinks, okay, okay, nobody knows, I got away with it. About an hour later, he hears a scream and he goes in the backyard and pretends he doesn't know what's going on. He looks over the fence, he goes, what's happening? And the neighbor says, you're never going to believe it. Fluffy died last week and we buried him, but he's back. <laughs> I, I just love the story, but what, what it reminds me of is this. What it reminds me of is this, is that we tend to go through life trying to cover up all of the dead stuff. We go through life trying to avoid trouble, avoid pain, and we try to cover it up and pretend like it never happened. We try to fake resurrection all the time. But only Jesus can bring real resurrection. Amen? And that's what we're here to celebrate this morning. We're here to celebrate that Jesus has the power of resurrection. You know, without Friday and the crucifixion, there's no forgiveness for our sins. And we are stuck. And when we get stuck, we just try to cover it up. Without our sins forgiven by the cross of Jesus, we just try to cover everything up and pretend that life is good. When on the inside, there's just death. And some of you know that feeling. Some of you understand Without Sunday and the resurrection, we have no hope and we have no chance at eternity. But thank God for the power and the promise of the resurrection. Amen? Amen. And that's what we're here to celebrate. There is great power and great promise in the resurrection of Jesus. So first, let's talk about the great power. I was thinking about power. And you know, you can Google anything these days, right? So I Googled, I just said, what is the most powerful thing in the universe? I was kind of hopeful thinking they would just put God, but it's Google, right? And so Google kept spitting back this up, and it led me overwhelmingly to these articles um, that said that the most powerful thing in our universe is gamma radiation. Uh, gamma radiation is what's caused when stars that are way bigger than our sun all of a sudden explode. And when they explode, they exhibit so much force that that force triggers this high beams of high energy radiation, which, by the way, are deadly for humans, right? And, and, and so the most powerful thing in the universe is trying to take us all out, right? That's if the most powerful thing in the universe is gamma radiation, 
right? It also, by the way, is what gives the Hulk his superpowers, right? But, but that's just in the movies. So, um, <laughs> but let's look at the story as the Bible tells it and discover what's the most powerful thing. In, in Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 4, it says this. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to, the t- went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord. Okay, this is like one, right? One, an angel of the Lord, one angel comes down, violent earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were as white as snow. And the guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. So the earth shook and so did the soldiers. Everything shook. In fact, you know what's interesting is Matthew, all, all, this is one of the things that fascinated me as I was reading through the Easter story this week, is you know that Jesus wasn't the only one that was resurrected. It, it says that this earthquake was so violent and there's so much power going on, it actually says in Matthew 27, uh, 52 and 53, it says, and the tombs broke open, the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. And they came out of their tombs after Jesus' resurrection, and they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Which tells me this, folks, and some of you really need to hear this this morning. Jesus' resurrection was not just isolated to Jesus. That the resurrection power is for everybody who who claims that he is Lord. But God displayed his mighty power in the resurrection. And that power is there for us today as well. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians 1, 18 to 20 says this. He says, I pray, and this is, as a pastor, this is my prayer as well. I pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for those of us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength that he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand, at his right hand in the heavenly realms. That power that shook the earth, that power that broke open the tombs, that power, Paul says, it's available to you and to me if we will just accept it and access it. I believe the great power for us today Today, I believe the greatest power for us is hope. The power of the resurrection is hope. And because because of the resurrection, you and I can have hope. Uh, but, But on that first Easter Sunday morning, as it started out, it seemed that all hope was lost. As the sun began to rise on that first Easter morning, the followers of Jesus were still in shock. Everything that they had put their hope in died with Jesus. No matter how many times Jesus tried to prepare them for the inevitability of his death, they just couldn't fathom it. They just couldn't get it. On Thursday, they saw him be arrested and tried. On Friday, they saw him beaten and crucified. On Saturday... Saturday, they were paralyzed by fear and in total shock and disbelief. So what did they do? They hid. They ran. On Saturday, all hope seemed lost. Their teacher, their leader, their Messiah, the one they trusted in, the one they had put all of their hope in, he had died and laid in a tomb. On that Saturday, the Sabbath, the religious leaders, they sat smug, believing that they had gotten rid of that false prophet. But to be sure, that just to make sure, they asked Pilate to post a guard outside the tomb to make sure that Jesus' body stayed in that grave. And on Saturday, Pilate and the Roman authorities, they breathed a sigh of relief, believing that they had just avoided a revolt, and they appeased the people into submission. On Saturday, the devil thought that he had won And that evil and death had triumphed. You know, we've all had Saturday experiences before. Moments when hope seems lost. A relationship falls apart. A child goes off the rails. 
the diagnosis isn't what you wanted, the loss of a job, the loss of a loved one. We've all been in those situations where we feel like hope is lost. And for the disciples of Jesus, Sunday morning started off that way as well. You know, in Luke 24, in verse 1, it tells us on the first day of the week, early in the morning, they, they have no idea what had just happened. Early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and they went to the tomb. Now, now why? You, you, you see, the ladies woke up that Easter morning not wondering if hats were in this year. Not wondering what they should wear to Easter Sunday service. They came prepared to embalm a dead body. They came to that tomb depressed, defeated, and without hope. But all of that was about to change. In, Luke, in verse 2 it says, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of their Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes gleamed like lightning stood beside them. And in their fright, the women bowed down to the ground with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day he would rise again. And then they remembered his words. It baffles me to this day why there wasn't 12 men sitting outside a tomb Counting down, 10, 9, 8, just waiting for what they had been told was about to happen. Believing the impossible had just happened, these ladies, they run to tell their friends. It says, when they came back from the tomb, they told these things to the 11 and all the others. It, it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them that told this, told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women. Because their words seemed like nonsense. I mean, did you catch that? The, these disciples that just spent three years with Jesus, these disciples that watched him raise people from the dead, raise Lazarus from the dead, these disciples said that to the women that what they're saying sounds like nonsense. Now, some of you can relate. Some of you are here this morning because someone drug you here. And you're sitting in church going, yeah, this all sounds like nonsense to me. If that's you, then that's okay. I'm glad you're here. And the reason is because you're in really good company because the people closest to Jesus thought it sounded like nonsense at the beginning. But to me, that's what makes this story so believable is the very people that were the closest, the very people that were following, they thought this was all nonsense at the beginning. I mean, it's amazing. It's amazing to me how they didn't get it. So if you struggle to make sense of the resurrection, it's okay. You're in good company with people like Peter. Because it says, Peter, however, he got up, he ran to the tomb, bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. Again, he's like, he goes in and he sees the empty tomb, he sees the grave clothes lying there, and he, sa he has this like brain freeze, and he's like, what happened? I mean, just think, I mean, think about that. Well, gee, gee, what happened? I mean, it just, it baffles me because Jesus had told them on so many occasions exactly what was going to happen. Here's the problem, folks. We don't listen to Jesus very well. We get so caught up in what's right in front of our faces in the situations and the circumstances of life that oftentimes we forget about the promises of Jesus. We forget. I mean, how many in this room think that you're just living absolutely in the power of the resurrection? Why is it that we're not supposed to? Well, because we let all this other junk get in the way. And then we get ourselves in a situation that goes, gee, I wonder what happened. It, we didn't listen to Jesus. I mean, Peter was left wondering. One of the things is for certain, even among the disciples, nobody expected to go to the tomb and find no body. Amen? There's even, and, and these guys scattered. These guys are scared to death now because they just saw what happens to people, right? They get hung on a cross. So some of these guys start to scatter. Two of them, they're going down this road. 
towards this town called Emmaus. And they're walking down the road, and they're, they're just like, can't believe what just happened. Can't believe Jesus is dead. They don't know what's going on. And what's amazing is then all of a sudden, Jesus, he just appears. And he starts walking with them. And, and he looks at them, and they don't recognize him, which is pretty, pretty trippy. And, and then it says, Jesus asks them what they're talking about. And, and then this is what they said in, in Luke 24. It starts in verse 19. He says, they were talking about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. And the chief priests and rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. Now listen to verse 21. This one's really important. It says this. It says, but we had hoped. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. We had hoped. Past tense. Right? You see, they had lost their hope. And, and some of you today, you, you, you know what it's like to, to be in hopeless situations. Where, where obstacles seem unsurmountable. You know all what it's like to have your, your hopes dashed and your dreams crushed or your plans altered and your lives turned upside down with just a word from someone. I gotta tell you, sometimes I miss it. S sometimes I get so involved in the circumstances of my life that, that I miss what God is up to. Sometimes all I can see is the way that the circumstances are piled up by my own decisions, and, and, and I start to lose hope. Let me tell you this. You know when you start to lose hope? It's when you lose Jesus. When you lose Jesus, you lose hope. If Jesus stayed in that grave, all hope is lost. Paul says this. If there is no resurrection, our faith is useless. But this morning... The power of the resurrection means that hope is alive. Do you believe that, church? Amen. 1 Peter 1, 3 and 4 says this. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You know, the word hope is used 92 times in the New Testament. It's only used four times before the resurrection. The other 88 times are all after the resurrection. So it's pretty obvious where hope comes from. It comes from the power of the resurrection. And because of the power of the resurrection, because of the hope that it reignited in these disciples' lives, this group of misfits and doubters, they ended up changing the world. And their message, you know what their message was when they went out and proclaimed it? Their message was the resurrection. All they preached was the resurrection of Jesus. They didn't go around and preach all kinds of, you know, oh, you know, this thing and that thing and this life and this thing. They didn't even have the Gospels for, for several years. They just went out and said, we can't help but talk about what we have seen and heard. We can't help but tell you that our leader, our friend, he was dead, crucified on a cross, but he came to life. And if he can come to life, like I said before, he proved he can deliver life for the rest of us. Maybe today you need hope. If so, it's available to you. Maybe like these followers of Jesus, maybe there's someone in the room this morning who's sitting here and you've lost all hope. You had hoped things would be different. You had hoped that that relationship would have worked out. You had hoped that you could get rid of the hurt, the habit, or the hang up. But only Jesus can do that. And we've got a place called CR where you can come and you can learn how to let Jesus take care of that loss of hope in your life. The power of the resurrection is hope. Because, the power of the, because of the power of the resurrection, even if you've been hopeless, you, my friend, can hope again. Do you believe that? Because of the power of resurrection, you can hope again. And while the power of resurrection is hope, the promise of resurrection is heaven. Man, I, I can't wait. Heaven. Romans 6, 4 to 7 says this. For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead. So just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father. Now we also may live new lives. 
But it gets better. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. In other words, the resurrection tells us that death is not the end. That, that death, see, before the resurrection, de death was the end of the story. You don't hear a whole lot about heaven or anything, even in the Old Testament in the Bible, because before the resurrection, death, death was pretty much like, you know, that was the end of the story. Most of the people that you read about in the Old Testament, they believed that when, when you died, that it was just over, that God just gave you a good life here and now. But the resurrection proved that Jesus conquered death and that there was more to life and, 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 the, and that heaven was made accessible by the resurrection. You know, it's interesting, in Ecclesiastes 3.11 says this, it says that God has planted eternity in the hearts of men. Don't you long for it? Don't, don't you know? I mean, even statistically, it, it is, as crazy as things are going in our country right now, I read a statistic the other day that still says 77% of the people in the United States believe there's a heaven. Some of them have a little wacky view of what that looks like. But at least, it, but the Bible says God put eternity in our hearts. God, God, God made us desire to go home. Yeah, maybe, you know, he, and, and he instilled that in all of nature, too. I mean, have you ever wondered? I mean, you know, homing pigeons, they say that they can fly thousands of miles, even from places that they've never been before, to get home. I mean, salmon, how do they figure out how to go up the right river? Right? God has put something inside of them. Gray whales, thousands of miles migrating to, to have their babies and go back and everything else. I mean, why, how is that? How, God put something inside of them, and God put something inside of you too. God put something inside of you that says, you, this is not your home. This is not your final destination. The best is yet to come. The Egyptian culture knew it. Do you know it took, they, they estimate over 100,000 people 40 years to build one pyramid? And why did they build it? It's just a tomb. Why did they spend all that time on a tomb? You know why? there was something deep inside of them that knew that they were going to spend more time in the next life than they were going to spend in this life. Now, how they got there and all that stuff was a little wacky and definitely not what we believe. But it just shows us that God has put something about eternity inside of our hearts and we long for that. But only Jesus could open the door for it. Jesus told us he was going to prepare a place for us. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My, in my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. He says, and I am, I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so you can be also where I am. 1 Corinthians 2.9 says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those that love him. I always love to say, it, it only took, I mean, don't, isn't, did you still see the mountains this morning? Did you see how beautiful it is out there? What an amazing creation we have. He did that in seven days. Six, really. But he's been working on your home for 2,000 years or more. Can you imagine what that's going to be like? Heaven is going to be Amazing. We're going to be re reunited with, with believers throughout the generations. I can't wait to celebrate with my dad, with my sister, with the people that we love. And together our voices will raise up and shout hallelujah. Revelation 21.3 says this, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying. There will be no more politics. The, <laughs> I knew I'd get a name over that. There will be no more crime. There will be no more murder. There will be no more racism. There will be no more anxiety. There will be no more cancer. Can I get an amen to that? Man, we, we, many of you have been praying for our brother um, Rob Bolton, and he is in the back this morning cancer-free. Amen? Mm. 
Now I, he needs a little space. Don't, don't, don't go crowding him this morning, okay? We're just so excited that they are here because it shows us the power, the power that God has. There will be no more shame. There will be no more guilt. There will be no more addiction. There will be no more divorce. There will be no more miscarriages. There will be no more migraines. There will be no more disease. Can somebody give me an amen? amen. I love the story that Max Lucado tells about a young gal named Kayla Montgomery. Some of, we have some runners in the room. How many runners we got in the room? Where are our Run for God folks? Come on. We, yeah, let's hear it for these guys. Um, yeah, they just ran last weekend. It was amazing. Um, this guy was a runner, one of the best high school runners in the country a few years back. Um, at one point, I mean, she ranked about in the top 20 in, in the country. But the problem was she had a horrible disease. She had no feeling in her legs. Imagine that. She was a runner. She no feeling in her legs when she ran. Kayla had a unique form of MS. And when her body temperature would start to heat up, her nerves around her spinal cord would start to inflame. And when they started to inflame, her legs would start to tingle, and, and then she would slowly lose all feeling in her legs up to her waist. Remarkably, she could still run. See, running wasn't the problem. She could run. But when it came to the finish line, she had no ability to decelerate. She could run. She just couldn't stop because she couldn't tell her legs to stop doing what they were already doing. For stopping, however, she depended on her coach. She would run, and as she came to the finish line, he would stand there just behind the finish line with arms open wide, and she would fall headlong into the open arms of her coach who would catch her. For stopping, she depended on him. She would run, and as she came into that line, right into his arms, she wouldn't even slow down. She would just dive right into his arms as they collided after that collision, they would rush her off the field where they would give her water and put ice all over her to start to cool her down because once her body temperature got back to normal, she could start to regain feeling in her legs again. She and her coach, they had an agreement. She did the running and he did the catching. And this was his promise to her that every time she ran, he would catch her. And folks, that's God's promise to us. The finish line of our lives is always getting closer. No matter how well you run this race, you can't run forever. And when you get to the end, you are going to need some help, someone to catch you. And that someone, well, I sure hope it's Jesus Christ, because he will not abandon you and as you come across that finish line, his promise to you is this. It is the promise of, that the resurrection, of the resurrection that nothing will keep him down and nothing can separate you from his love. On the cross, he bought you. He redeemed you. And he's preparing a place for you. But heaven, heaven is a perfect place. It's a perfect place for people who've been made perfect. And you and I are far from perfect. I didn't hear an amen on that one. <laughs> but Jesus was, and Jesus still is. But on the cross, he exchanged places with us. He took our pay, place and he paid for our sins. And the resurrection opened the door to make it all possible. The question is, this morning, have you received the amazing gift of God's grace? Do you know who's going to catch you when you cross that finish line? If not, well, man, if not, for heaven's sake, take him up on the promise today because he loves you so much. He wants to lavish his love and his grace on you. 
Psalms 103, 10 to 13 says this. He says, he does not treat us as our sins deserve. He does not repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is the Father's love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us, as, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. On the cross, Jesus finished the work so that you could finish the race. And if you will put your trust in him, he promises, he promises you, he promises that he will catch you with his arms wide open, as open as they were on the cross. Jesus died so your sins could be forgiven, and he rose so that you could have the power of hope and the promise of heaven. The power and the promise of the resurrection can be yours. If you're in need of hope this morning, if you want to be sure that you have the promise of heaven, that that Jesus is going to catch you as you cross that finish line, then please, please come and talk to us today. As as we sing the last song, we, we are going to thank our Heavenly Father. Thank Him for the power and the promise of the resurrection. But this morning, don't leave this place until it's yours. And I'm going to ask our, our elders and staff, anyone who's here, to just come up. And if, if while we're singing, we're, we're going to have a blast singing and thanking and praising our Father for the power and promise of the resurrection. But make sure that that promise is yours. Because Jesus died to prove that he could, do, he, Jesus died to, to forgive your sins. And he rose to give you life. And he can deliver. Amen? Amen. Together, let's give thanks for the power and the promise that the resurrection brings. Let's let's stand and pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Father, for the power of the resurrection. Thank you, Father, that it's not just a power that happened one day long ago. It's not just a power that's out there somewhere, but it is a power that is available for us today. It's a a power to give us hope, and there's a promise to give us eternal life. And Father, my prayer is that today, today someone who needs that promise will claim it. And Father, someone who needs hope will receive it as they receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you in Jesus name amen you guys ready to